Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Audio is coming through? Outstanding. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll, we'll get started right at four o'clock uh, uh, AEST today, just because uh, I want to give us uh, the maximum amount of time to uh, for our presenter and for our, our, our question and answer section. Um, before I begin, I'd like to um, start everything off by acknowledging the uh, ancestral and traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, uh, specifically the Ngunnawal and Nambri peoples, the First Nations, and we must, uh, we pay our respect to uh, elders past, present, and emerging. Um, so uh, just proceeding from that, I'll, I'll just have a quick note about our speaker today, and it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Associate Professor Emily Williams, who is joining us uh, online today from Xi'an Jiaotong Liverpool University in Suzhou. Just a little bit about Emily. She is a cultural historian of modern China with a particular interest in Maoist material culture and collections of so-called red relics uh, in contemporary China. Her first book, which will be the focus of today's talk, Collecting the Revolution, British Engagement with Chinese Cultural Revolution Material Culture, came out with Roman and Littlefield this year in 2022. Uh, at Xi'an Jiaotong uh, Liverpool University, uh, Emily teaches modules in Chinese history, society, and aesthetics, and we welcome our speaker today, Emily Williams, with great pleasure and honor. Emily. Great. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So I'd like to start off by um, thanking Matt uh, very much for the invitation. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to be here today and to, to share my, my research with you. Um, and also like to, to say thank you to Matt for um, involving me in other projects as well over the past um, couple of years. So it's been a real pleasure to work with you and hope we can continue in the future. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to Nancy, who um, helped arrange the timing, um, and to thank all of you for, for coming to, to listen today. So, um, uh, as Matt said, the, the topic of my uh, talk today is, is um, related to my book, Collecting the Revolution, um, British Engagements with Chinese Cultural Revolution Material Culture. Um, and if I can just uh, start with um, a kind of shameless plug, uh, this is... Uh, this is the, um, the cover of it, you can see it. Um, like most academic books, uh, it's kind of outrageously expensive. Um, but if you are in the position, please ask your library to buy it um, for you. Uh, and uh, there's also the cheaper version available as, a, as an ebook on Kindle. Um, if there are any um, students or contingent staff or um, kind of anybody who's interested in reading the book but doesn't have access to it um, and doesn't want to spend 120 to buy it, which I understand very well, um, please just send me an email and um, I'm sure we can figure something out. I've got my email on the, the first slide and I can remind you at the end as well. Okay, so I know that um, Matt recently gave um, his own book talk, um, which of course fits within the sphere of global Maoism. Um, and given that the seminar today is through the Australian Centre on Time in the World, um, I'm guessing that a lot of you who are listening um, are at least kind of somewhat aware of this field of global Maoism um, as a field of academic study. And I want to start by trying to position my own research um, within this field. So we can understand global Maoism as a political ideology, I'm um, sorry, we can understand it as the widespread engagement and um, many people and groups had with Mao's China, with Maoism as a political ideology and or revolutionary program, and with attempts to think through what application of Maoist ideas might mean to their society, their community, or to them as individuals. It most typically refers to this interest in the late 1960s um, and 70s, um, but of course the influence um, of Maoism and China and elsewhere lasted after Mao's death in 1976. Now there's been a tendency within some of the literature to look down on some of the particularly Western engagements with Maoism as representing little more than infantile enthusiasm or infantile fanaticism, condemned for misunderstanding the reality of the Cultural Revolution or for dreaming and in some cases attempting to apply its practices to their own uh, more developed societies without much prospect of success. Implicit behind this type of criticism is that these engagements weren't really worth taking seriously, or perhaps that the ideas being engaged with aren't, work take, aren't worth taking seriously due to their low likelihood of success. 
And if you want to sort of read a criticism of, of this strand of, of um, global Maoisms, um, I would recommend Fabio Lanza's critique um, in the ANU um, publication, um, Afterlives of Chinese Communism. But if Western Maoism gets looked down upon, I think we can say British Maoism gets overlooked altogether. And this is true from both sides, both by China scholars and by scholars of the far left in Britain, who have instead focused on Trotskyists and Orthodox communists. Now, to a certain extent, there's actually a good reason for this. Um, a text from 1976 estimated that there were approximately 1,500 members of China-oriented Marxist-Leninist groups, uh, compared to 14,000 Trotskyists and 28,000 members of the Communist Party of Great Britain, which had sided with the Soviet Union and the, the Sino-Soviet split. So the numbers of out-and-out uh, Maoists in the UK um, are always very small. And I think it's also true that Maoism as a political theory or as a set of um, political or practicable ideas also didn't necessarily have a big impact on intellectuals or activists, um, although it was certainly part of the kind of milieu as I'll talk about today. But I think if we want to understand China's place in the, the global 60s or in the post-World War II era more broadly, we also need to go beyond these strictly political or ideological alignments to look at the concept of engagements more broadly. Britain, particularly by virtue of its continued colonial possession of Hong Kong and its diplomatic uh, mission in Beijing throughout the Mao years, um, had, I think, a particularly interesting set of engagements with Mao's China. But approaching Britain, um, Britain's place in the sphere of global Maoism required a slightly different methodology than that which is normally used in, in global Maoism. We can't read texts by top intellectuals to search for the influence of Mao. We can't track the trips um, to Beijing by the kind of revolution, revolutionary leaders or political activists. Um, and so I found a, a different method, which was to track the movement of objects, Chinese political material culture from China to the UK. Understanding the transnational flow of things is to then part of China's place in the global 60s. And these objects have particularly interesting routes of travel in the UK because a large number of them ended up in our most august um, public museums, as I'll talk about towards the end of the talk. So my intention then in using objects is not to see them as just kind of illustrations, right, to visualize something that we already know or that we found out from reading texts and documents, um, but to actually use them as a research method. And in particular, I'm interested in what the travel of objects demonstrate about British engagements with Mao's China, with how the Cultural Revolution and Chinese Communism more broadly was understood through objects. Um, and I'm interested in the relationship that people had with objects, what these objects meant to them, how they understood them in terms of what they represented about China and, and so on. And I'm interested in, in both how objects shaped our views of the Cultural Revolution, but also in how our pre-existing prejudices, perspectives, and ideologies impacted the ways in which we um, viewed these objects. Um, now, to a certain extent, I think objects have always been kind of key to how the West has known China, right? The way that the country was depicted on porcelain, for example, um, played a big role in shaping ideas about what China looked like and what China was like as a society. In fact, a lot of this porcelain was designed specifically to appeal to the British audience. And, you know, by the 60s and 70s, China was still a fairly peripheral um, country and concept to, to kind of people in Britain. There wasn't a lot known about it. Travel, of course, was very difficult, especially once the Cultural Revolution started. Um, there was a lot of misunderstanding about what was going on. And so I argue that visual and material representations played an important role in shaping British ideas about the Cultural Revolution and Chinese communisms, um, of course, in ways that tell us as much about Britain and British society at the time as they do about China. Okay, so in the last uh, couple of years, we've had perhaps a, a glut of um, books and talks titled things like, you know, the history of the world and 100 objects, history of time, talks. Um, so it's perhaps a little cliched now, but I'm going to offer um, the British, a history of the British engagements with communist China in four objects. Um, so basically what I'm hoping to do today is to start with a number of objects and then basically open up the story of these objects and um, talk about their routes of travel, their owners, um, and try to give a sense of the diversity of British engagements with Mao's China through these objects. Um, all of these objects are currently in public or private collections, um, and I'll explain at the end um, in particular why I think these public collections are important. Okay. 
Okay, so this is our first poster, this first object. It's a 1966 poster called Long Live the Victory of the People's War. And it was owned by David King and is now in the collection of the Tate Archives. Um, you can see it has a nice quote from Mao on, on the bottom from 1958. And um, I've got the, the text of the quote um, on the side there. Okay, so this is an, a rather nice poster. It's talking about kind of imperialism, people's war, people power, um, all of these things. The, story, the, the poster is, is nice in itself, but I think the story of its owner is even more interesting. And I want to use this as a kind of introduction to what the sort of zeitgeist in Britain was um, in the late 1960s. So as I said, its previous owner was David King. Um, he was graphic designer, author, and collector. Uh, some of you may know his name. Um, he is particularly famous for his collection of Soviet material uh, and his publications that aim to recover those individuals that had been removed um, either physically uh, from photographs or other historical records in the sort of Stalinist rewritings of history. Um, he was inspired by the work of the Russian constructivists in the, the 1920s, um, and he aimed to establish a new visual form for the new left. He worked for the Sunday Times magazine from 1965 to 75, and he developed a signature visual aesthetic for the, for the magazine, um, which he also used in his designs for a series of posters and pamphlets and um, promoting anti-imperialist, anti-fascist, anti-racist, and in particular anti-apartheid um, causes uh, like the one that you can see on the PowerPoint, which is uh, a poster for um, uh, an event uh, in um, Trafalgar Square in a march uh, in 1978. Now, during uh, a 1970 research trip to the Soviet Union uh, for a feature on the centenary of Lenin's birth, he noticed the sort of total absence of Leon Trotsky. Um, and this led to a lifelong project um, to search for visual evidence of those excluded from Stalinist narrative. Um, and it also led to a 1971 Penguin book on Trotsky that sold 25,000 copies. Um, so as somebody who's recently published a book, uh, I can say that 25,000 copies is, is pretty good going. So you can see a, a photo of, of the cover um, of his book on the slide. So as I sort of suggested, um, David King is, is very well known in the UK, at least for his Soviet collecting, but he was also interested in other communist movements throughout his life. Um, as part of this investigation, he was kind of always going through um, into what had gone wrong in the Soviet Union and what other objects might exist. Um, and so I can give a quote from King. He said, suddenly in the late 1960s here in the UK, everybody was interested in Trotsky and one or two other figures as major alternatives to Stalinism. There was a crisis and people were looking for alternatives. Now, for King, Maoism was never going to be a model for cultural change in Britain. And um, as I suggested, he's more interested in Trotsky. Uh, but for him, he saw China as worth observing because it seemed to be one of the few places attempting something different. And in particular, the Cultural Revolution seemed to be the start of something genuinely new. Around the time, uh, around the mid 60s, King began to collect Soviet objects, and he also began to collect Chinese objects at this time. Uh, and this post I've shown you was actually the first um, Chinese poster that he collected. It was gifted to him by the photographer Donald McCullen, who had risen to prominence for his coverage of the Vietnam War, amongst other um, international crises. Now, David King was quite an exceptional guy, uh, very eccentric, um, incredibly intelligent, uh, and very dedicated to left wing causes. And I was lucky enough to spend some time with him um, before he passed away in 2016. So I'm not saying that he's the kind of, you know, the same as everybody at the time, but I do think that he represents quite a lot of the sort of left wing subcultures of the time. In Britain, perhaps unlike somewhere like France, there was not necessarily many intellectuals, activists, or students who explicitly identified themselves as, Maoist, as Maoists. But instead, I think Maoism represented a kind of undercurrent in the UK, an option of a communist country that was attempting a different path from both Western liberal democracies and Soviet communism. And I think for those on the left, if we understand that in the broadest possible sense, Maoism functioned um, as in two main ways. So firstly, as uh, inspiration for activism and for uh, a belief that cultural change mattered. And this worked at both the academic or kind of intellectual level and at a more practical one. So for starters, Maoism was a feature of the, the new left and in British intellectual thought that investigated the Marxist tradition outside 
by Marxist-Leninist or Communist Party orthodoxy, in large part due to disillusionment with the Soviet Union from the late 1950s onwards. Maoism then fit within this kind of broader search for alternative theories and was appealing because of its focus on cultural, ideological, and social change in contrast with the typical emphasis on economic change and political power associated with Soviet socialism. <coughs> Excuse me. Some intellectuals from the New Left had a sort of proxy engagement um, with Mao uh, via Althusser, the French theorist, um, who was a course, an important theorist for the New Left alongside um, Gramsci and others. <clears throat> arguing that Maoism necessarily had a big role to play, um, but certainly for people trying to understand what had gone wrong in the Soviet Union, what else could be done, Mao's China and the Cultural Revolution, which was understood as a revolution in the ideological superstructure, seemed to be an example of a country trying to find a more equal way forward. And certainly China was of interest to the student movement in the 60s and 70s in Britain in the same way as it was um, elsewhere. Most of this interest was fairly superficial. And as I said at the start, this has led to some scholars being perhaps somewhat derogatory about the impact of Maoism on Western student movements or perhaps derogatory about the students themselves. But I think that that's sort of missing the point actually. The students and the activists were trying to analyze the problems in their own society and they borrowed from other countries as part of these critiques. While we can certainly point out that they often did so in an orientalizing and exoticizing way, we should also sort of remember what the purpose was of China for these students or activists. China was important insofar as it helped the students to open up options for analysis um, or action in their own countries. The fact that they didn't necessarily understand it very well um, was something that they were actually often aware of, um, but it was sort of operating more at the level of kind of broad inspiration. What we see is students and others appropriating the leftist language and imagery of foreign leaders, philosophers, and countries to legitimize their own complaints against structures of authority. These engagements were necessarily piecemeal, but it's a reminder, I think, that our politics are often not driven entirely rationally or intellectually, no matter how much we, we might like to pretend they are, but that they are effective, right? They are emotional and moral. They're about feelings of righteousness, hope, and inspiration. And so a casual interest in the events of China could fit very well into that kind of broader feeling that change was possible and necessary. Um, and so I've just pulled out a couple of um, quotes from some uh, people who were influential within the student movement in the UK, um, where they sort of mention, you know, the way in which um, China functioned for them. So first off, I'm um, from David Fernbach, who was a student as the, at the LSE um, and a radical member of the Socialist Society. And he said, um, as important as the counterculture, if not more so for many radical students, was the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Although it took us a long time to understand much about it, except that it was a great upheaval, that in some ways it was against authority and the entrenching of a new system of privilege and power in post-revolutionary society, it had a great effect on us morally. Similarly, Kim Howells, who was active in the student occupation of the Horn College of Art in May 68, uh, and who was later actually a, a Labour MP, um, he saw his own actions in light of those ongoing in China, writing, I was very keen on storming buildings, I really saw myself as a red guard when I went in and told the principal he had to leave his office because the student body had decided we needed. So China's strong anti-imperialist statements were of course very impactful in the context of the widespread anti-Vietnam war protests and perhaps more broadly as well in a Britain that was still sort of really coming to terms with the end of its empire and with the legacies of um, its own imperialism. Um, and in this context, I think China was a country that was admired for offering a model of development um, for the newly independent um, countries of the global south that would allow them to break away from the dependence on former colonial centers. So again, we can understand this as all kind of part of that post-war reckoning that was ongoing um, within Britain, British society. I don't think many people in Britain saw the Chinese model of development as applicable there in Britain, um, but certainly an interest in Maoism fit into the ongoing criticisms of modernization theory and the problematic ways in which um, decolonization was reproducing relations of dependence. Um, and so Maoism with its focus on self-reliance and people power development seemed a more sort of promising um, option. And so um, the other sort of main way we see people talking about the influence of Maoism on them 
is thinking about uh, you know, post Maoist influence on um, ideas of post-colonial development. Um, so we are uh, Delia Davin, who was a historian of China, particular gender in China. Um, she was a resident in China in the 60s and again in the 70s. And um, she described in an interview with me the importance of China's anti-imperial and anti-colonial positioning to sparking her interest in the country. And she recalled China meant third world above all for me and uh, for then husband Bill Jenner. It is not altogether irrelevant that my elder sister uh, went to Algeria when I was in my second year in China and my younger sister went to Zambia. We belong to a generation when radical people felt the third world was where it was all at, where interesting things were happening and where we wanted to be. Similarly, sociologist Peter Worsley, who published a book in uh, 1972 about a recent trip that he had uh, taken to China. Sorry, the book was published in 75, but his trip to China was in 72. He saw China as one of the sort of few examples of successful post-colonial development. And so he wrote in this book, I was one of the generation reared on Edgar Snow's Red Star over China and published in 1937 and still the best background book for understanding China. I've tried to keep abreast of what has happened within China since um, and to relate Chinese development to development to be strict to non-development in the rest of the third world. So I think we can see China as functioning on a number of different levels for the British left. It's a model for anti-imperialist or anti-capitalist revolutions. Uh, it provides an alternative model of development that avoids both the traps of um, capitalist development with all of its inequalities um, and the sort of uh, bureaucratic socialism of, of the Soviet Union. It provided an example of student-led uprisings that resulted in real cultural and political change through the Cultural Revolution, um, particularly in in the 1970s, uh, it provided inspiration to a number of um, feminist, uh, Black British, and um, immigrant groups who were interested in rethinking um, social norms uh, in the UK. And then for a very small number, it, it functioned as direct political inspiration, right, for the Marxist, uh, Leninist, Mao Zedong thought groups. So I think that a lot of these kind of strands come together in David King and his Chinese poster. Um, while he only traveled to China once, he collected over 200 posters and thousands of photographs and hundreds of periodical, uh, periodicals, including the whole run of China Pictorial um, and a variety of other objects, uh, which he stored in his Islington home and most of which are now in the Tate in London. So object one um, shows that even though Britain didn't necessarily have a big movement like other Western countries, Maoism and an interest in Mao's China was certainly part of the broader cultural environment and represented parts of broader efforts to rethink Chinese society and Britain's place in the world. Um, it's certainly true that many who expressed an interest in the Cultural Revolution had only a tentative grasp on it, but we do see a willingness to learn from Chinese leadership and this idea that China was at the kind of forefront of cultural development. Um, all that said, of course, a wide, uh, widespread or mainstream view of the Cultural Revolution was not that that I've just been describing. Rather, it was seen as a kind of um, chaotic or violent uh, upheaval. And the British establishment had a particularly interesting experience of this, um, given uh, Hong Kong and uh, the diplomatic mission in Beijing. So our second object represents this more official experience of the Cultural Revolution. It's a paper cut owned by an individual named George Walden. So the paper cut um, shows a young Mao based on the photograph uh, taken by the American journalist Edgar Snow, um, and it's pictured over the site of the, the Zuni conference, which was an important CCP meeting site from the Long March that start, that marked the, the rise of Mao's um, kind of real rise within the party leadership. Um, underneath there's the, the slogan, Long Live Chairman Mao, right, Mao Jixi Wan Sui, um, and it was a part of a series of 12 paper cuts um, showing different stages of Mao's life um, that the owner, George Walden, purchased in um, Beijing in 1968. So George Walden was a diplomat who worked on the Soviet desk um, before transferring to Chinese in 1964. Um, he was then sent to Hong Kong in 1965 for language training, where he was witness to the demonstrations, the strikes and the bombings in the colony at the start of the Cultural Revolution. And he arrived in Beijing in 1967, soon after the attack on the British mission, um, of course, a moment of great uh, tension for Sino-British relations. <laughs> 
In Beijing, Walden's role was second secretary political with additional responsibility for several attache roles, but really his job was simply trying to find out what was going on. And one of the points that I, I make um, throughout the book is that this material and visual culture was one of the ways in which people understood the Cultural Revolution. In Walden's case, this is kind of more literally true, right? He's trying to read um, the, the Datsabao, the Red Guard newspapers, the pamphlets to kind of desperately um, figure out what's really going on behind the scenes. Um, and as a result, engaging with the material and visual culture of the Cultural Revolution occupied a significant part of Walden's time in Beijing, and they feature heavily in his recollections. In his memoir, he writes, for me at least, uh, these were adventurous times. I have an agreeable memory of setting out on my poster reading scene observing round in my extra duty uh, uh, overcoat and fur hat on icy days when the air seemed as bracing as the tingling political atmosphere. What's perhaps most interesting is that Walden is actually an avowed anti-communist, and indeed he was later um, a conservative NP from 1983 to 1997, and he served in Margaret Thatcher's government um, as Minister for Higher Education. And we can see his views um, quite clearly in terms of how he describes his memories of the Cultural Revolution. He says, it's not easy to shake off the memory of the semi-crazed faces and chants of Maoist marchers, the transformation of millions of human beings into malignant-eyed robots. Outside North Korea, it was difficult to imagine an entire people behaving in such a zombie manner of the human personality being reduced to nothing. So I think probably Walden represented something closer to the mainstream view on, on the Cultural Revolution, although of course he's doing so from a privileged position. But I think his engagement with the visual and material culture can tell us two things. The first is that our engagements with material and visual culture shape, but also reflect our perceptions and perspectives, right? It works both ways. For those critical of China, the outpouring of Datsabao, of posters, of Mao badges, reflected the destruction of individuality in China or reflected the Mao cult gone mad. For those more positively inclined, they represented mass democracy and the production of a new type of human-centered social organization. And what's interesting is that proponents of these kind of diverse and often contradictory views on China often drew on the same Chinese material and visual culture as evidence of their, their perspectives. Walden's antipathy towards communism informs his reading of material culture, which is also then confirmed by what he sees in the visual environment. He even sees violence in the writing of the Datsabao. Um, he talks about how the artists behave as, as if they have the enemies of the people before them and were slicing them to ribbons. Whereas more sympathetic observers see energy and vitality. And this is something that um, I, I saw numerous times throughout my study that cultural revolution art and objects can be used as proof or as evidence of whatever their view of China was. Um, and this was something that was done by both the right and the left. And it reminds us that there's no neutral way to view or engage with objects, that every encounter is situated within a global system of knowledge production, intersected by the singularities of individual positioning and outlook. And yet, what Mal Walden's ownership of this paper cut some 50 years later reminds us is that our relationship with objects do not purely mirror or map onto ideology. Following the roots of objects led me to people with these kind of interesting engagements with China that we wouldn't find if we were only looking for Maoists or only considering ideological and political engagements. Um, and Walden writes about finding these paper cuts in his, his memoirs, praising their artistic nature. He says, they were superb poster-sized cutouts whose craftsmanship and intricacy of design made them comparable in their way to the Rus Russian poster art of the 1920s. Alongside um, these kind of communist objects like these paper cuts, Walden also built up a, a more substantial collection of traditional scroll painting while he was there. So it is true that his acquisition habits reflected his politics. Um, and I think these paper cuts are something of an anomaly. But I think it's still noteworthy that some 50 years on, he still owns the full set um, and he displays them um, in his Chelsea home. They're very well cared for. 
Objects can catch our attention or take our fancy for all sorts of reasons that go beyond an alignment with our politics. And this results in some perhaps um, surprising routes of travel uh, that take communist objects into the hands of some unlikely owners. Um, and we can see that in this poster, uh, which is now in the collection of the Victorian Albert Museum in London, but was actually bought in China by um, Lady Anne Heseltine, and um, whose husband, the conservative politician, uh, Lord Michael Heseltine, um, Tyne is perhaps best known for his role in bringing down uh, Margaret Thatcher's government. A decade and a half earlier, Heseltine had been the Minister for Aerospace and Shipping, and after the agreement of full diplomatic relations between China and the UK in 1972, there was a flurry of diplomatic visits and delegations, especially from the Department of Trade and Industry, which saw China as an untapped market ready to buy British goods and power the resurgence of British manufacturing. Of course, it didn't quite turn out like that. Um, the Hesseltines were on one such delegation in March of 1973, and Anne um, acquired these posters on an organized shopping outing for the wives of delegates in Beijing. Um, and then she later donated them to the VA, an institution that she was also a trustee for. So we often hear about this idea of kind of China being closed under Mao and then opened up um, under Deng Xiaoping. And it's true, of course, that the rate of exchange of people and goods and ideas increased in the reform era. But I think, you know, one of the things that global Maoisms has helped us to understand is that China was still very much part of the world in the Mao era. And what tracking the movement of objects and people between China and the UK reminded me is that we should see um, open and closed not as a binary, but maybe more as a spectrum. By the early 1970s, there were starting to be more opportunities for British people to travel to China on organized tours and to work in China, usually as English teachers or translators. Uh, and to study in China. Uh, and some of these people wrote books or, or newspaper articles about their time in China once they got back. And they all sort of have this sense of, you know, you have to be on the ground in order to understand it, right? You have to be there to understand it, usually as part of their praise of Chinese development. But I think there's also a paradox here because it was also very clear in these writings and particularly in later memoirs that were published that any form of cultural integration was kind of largely impossible at this time. Um, and the topic of isolation from Chinese people and culture um, or the continued kind of opacity of Chinese culture features heavily in these people's um, memories. So if we want to think about the idea of kind of opened and closed, you know, we also need to remember that even for those who were there at the time, um, accessing uh, Chinese culture um, still uh, remained really difficult. Um, and so we can see kind of these feelings of, of isolation in some of these quotes um, that I've got on the PowerPoint. Uh, the first is from an Australian student, um, Beverly Hooper, who of course uh, later became a well-known academic and um, who arrived in China in 1975. And she said, uh, I want to get to know the people was a common um, if naive expression heard amongst recently arrived students. Before long, the people in Peking, over 8 million of them were reduced chiefly to the Chinese students and teachers at the Language Institute. Francis Wood um, said foreign students had so little communication with ordinary people and such a sense of otherness. Uh, and Richard Kirkby, uh, who uh, wrote one of the first books on Chinese urbanization, um, later in his memoir wrote, any normal human contact with Chinese people um, was out of the question. Whether inside or outside our guarded compounds, communications with the great Chinese masses was limited to curt transactional exchanges. <clears throat> And so I want to suggest that engaging with objects was one entry point into Chinese culture, and especially for those living there at the time, and we can see um, object three as an example of this. So my third object is this rather attractive enamel mug that's owned by Francis Wood, and um, it has the, the famous Mao quote, a single spark can start a prairie fire on it. Um, Francis Wood was later the lead curator of the Chinese collection at the British Library um, and was a student in China um, in 1975-76. So she was part of the um, early group of Western students um, who were sent to study in China in the 70s. Uh, in the case of British students from 1973, the British Council sent groups of 10 students per year. Um, and while I can't sort of really prove it, it's my sense that the British contingent, as well as being amongst the largest of the Western student groups, um, were also more diverse in their perspectives than many of the other, particularly European groups, um, who often had students who had been part of the Maoist movement in their home countries. 
Um, and Craig Clunas, the Oxford University art historian, um, who was part of the 1974 cohort, uh, recalled, and this is a quote, the tiny British student community ranged itself along the spectrum of skepticism and hope regarding the, the ideal new civilization portrayed in the posters. So Frances Wood was working on her doctoral research at this time, and it was her habit to basically cycle around Beijing taking photos of domestic architecture. But she would also look into any daily goods store she came across, and she began to develop a collection of enamel mugs. Initially, she put, purchased these mugs with revolutionary slogans on them, but as these became less common, particularly into 1976, she began to acquire mugs with any sort of Chinese writing on them, um, which I think is at least you know, partially a reflection of the fact that she's in China studying the language. And within this kind of seemingly narrow category, enamel mugs with Chinese characters, Wood found a huge and unexpected diversity, and she made a collection of several dozen, which she later brought back with her to the UK. <clears throat> the mugs themselves, I think, are quite interesting, um, as the changing themes over time tell us something about the political changes higher up. But Woods was also interested in the process of shopping, and in particular, in watching Chinese people um, shopping uh, and the complex uh, process through which they negotiated new purchases. For Wood, the growing availability of decorative everyday objects and the intense interest people showed in buying new ones communicated to her something of the nature of change already way in Chinese society even before Mao died. Now we often think of um, these sorts of purchases, right, buying mugs on holiday um, as little more than souvenir purchasing and we don't give it much more thought. But I think in a culture like China at this time, with this kind of continued wariness towards foreigners, it's not surprising that many of the, the people who spent time there searched for kind of visual or material routes of entry. Um, as Craig, Craig Clunas has written, in the context of the difficulties of developing relations with people whilst in Beijing, um, in these conditions, it's not surprising that much of my engagement with the city was strongly visual. And Wood was um, not alone in this. A lot of the people that I interviewed who had spent time in China in the 70s um, also developed collections of various objects. You can see some of them on the PowerPoint. Uh, many of them still possess them now, even displaying them in their homes um, or have donated them to national museums. So throughout, I've been mentioning these public collections of objects, and I'd like to finish by talking about them and why I think they are important. Um, so uh, the discovery of these public collections was actually the starting point for my research. I know I've put it at the end of my talk, but this was actually what, what sparked my research um, in the first place. The discovery of, um, you know, the most famous British institutions, the British Museum, the Victorian Albert Museum, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, um, the National Museum of Scotland in, um, in Edinburgh and others, all having substantial collections of Maoist material culture. And if we think of the grand collections of Chinese art around the world, uh, the Musée uh, Guimet or Chernusky in France, the Freer and Sackler galleries in the US, etc., they very rarely include objects um, from the Mao era in their collections. They are often restricted to the imperial period altogether, or if they move into the 20th century, they are typically, typically restricted to art practiced in traditional forms. So they very rarely incorporate objects that are deliberately political in intention and that are mass produced and propagandistic in the way that a number of the UK's most important institutions do. And the PowerPoint I just put into the search uh, engines for these, these museums like China communism, you can just see a sort of selection of um, some of the objects that they all have. Okay, so then this led to the question of how do these objects get into museums and, and why are these museum collections important? Um, and this takes us to our final object, um, a Shaoshan badge uh, acquired in Shaoshan between 1973 and 75 by the British student um, Penny Brook, uh, who was later the deputy director of the Great Britain China Center. The badge shows Mao's um, childhood home, which of course was a popular site for revolutionary tourism during the Mao era and indeed today, and was one of the places that foreigners were taken to on tours. Brooke purchased dozens of poster, uh, sorry, dozens of badges during her time in China, and she described shopping as one of the sort of few leisure activities open to foreigners at this time, right? So you, you bought things because you didn't really have anything else to do. Um, and when she got home, she basically put away the badges until the early 2000s when she decided to donate them to the British Museum, which um, already at that point had started a collection of Mao badges. Um, and I choose Penny Brook um, as the example uh, because this is in fact how a large proportion of the Mao era objects 
um, that are now in these museum collections entered the institutions. They were souvenirs or collectibles um, brought back by a wide variety of people um, who were interested and engaged with China um, from a variety of ideological perspectives, but who all picked up objects on their travels. And as they've aged, they've um, sought out new homes for these objects. Um, and, uh, and through donations and sales, they've entered these museums. And to a certain extent, this all sounds like quite a natural process, right? But what is interesting is that it largely hasn't happened elsewhere, right? So Britain is actually really pretty unique in this. And um, so we can sort of try to understand the process through which they entered in Britain and, and not elsewhere. And I think what's crucial to it in the British context was an institutional openness to the 20th century, um, particularly at the British Museum and the V&A in the late 1970s and early 80s, due to policies by the directors that aimed to keep the museums relevant. There wasn't, therefore, a deliberate decision made to collect Maoist material culture. Um, and indeed, as British Museum curator Mary Ginsburg has argued, uh, and this is the quote you can see on the PowerPoint, a specific objective when collecting 20th century paintings was to find showing cultural continuity. In other words, not political painting, not propaganda. More generally, the mass-produced offerings of the Cultural Revolution were not considered appropriate uh, museum material for a long time. And the V&A curator Rose Kerr uh, recalled, um, and this is a quote, I think prior to 1992, I didn't regard anything I owned as being museum worthy, but perspectives change as the years gone by. And Kerr um, and many other uh, curators had been students um, in China in the 1970s, and they later, uh, as their perspectives changed, donated their own objects to museums. So there wasn't necessarily a sort of outright desire to collect um, these kind of political objects. And yet, as Ginsburg has noted, uh, although political art was not specifically sought, it naturally features large in the output of countries whose cultural policy has specifically promoted propaganda. And so essentially what we see is this type of work um, beginning to find its way into museum collections in the early 80s, almost entirely from donations. Um, and then in larger numbers in the 90s, uh, when it begins to be more specifically sought out. And then into the 2000s, as these uh, people who were students in the 70s um, have aged and have begin, begun to donate or sell their objects. And what this has meant is that the image of China presented at British public institutions is quite different from that elsewhere. There is no doubt that the dominant depiction remains one of an imperial China. Um, until its recent renovation of the Joseph Hotong Gallery, the British Museum, for example, had no post-imperial objects on long-term display. But the Victorian Albert Museum and the National Museums of Scotland much earlier on began to put Mao era objects on display uh, with the, the National Museum of Scotland holding a temporary exhibition of Maoist material culture as early as 2003 and having objects on long term display from at least um, 2011. The majority of the, the NMS collection comes from British collectors Peter and Susan Wayne, uh, who were based in Hong Kong in the late 1960s, um, uh, where Peter was a, a captain in the British Army. Um, and they uh, became uh, porcelain collectors of imperial and modern works um, throughout uh, the Mao years and then into the reform era as well. And the, the slide you can, the picture you can see in the middle is um, a, uh, a lacquer. Um, uh, work that uh, was in the collection of Peter and Susan Wayne before it entered the National Museum of Scotland. Now, establishing causality is impossible, but I want to suggest that the fact that Britain didn't have such a widespread Maoist movement in the 60s and 70s actually made it easier for these institutions to incorporate these objects into their collections. And I think these collections are important because they allow the British uh, institutions to beyond the sort of imperial fetish that we see in most museum depictions of China around the world. They also, I suggest, function as archives of British engagements with Mao's China. The v &A curator um, Zhang Hongxing has positioned their collection of Maoist objects directly as such, telling me that when the v &A deputy director Beth McKillop, um, had been a student in, uh, who had been a student in China in the mid 70s, offered a number of posters and her husband's old Mao suit, um, he accepted them less because they were important historical artifacts for China and more because they were a, a legacy of a particular British experience of Mao's China. 
So to conclude, I suggest that having a series of quite diverse collections of Mao era and particularly cultural revolution era material culture at British museums allows these institutions to, first of all, update the depiction of China on display and move beyond a kind of purely imperial focus. Um, I think it's noteworthy, of course, that these objects, um, particularly the Cultural Revolution ones, are unlikely to be displayed in an official capacity in China, although, of course, you do see them in private spaces, online, in markets, all of that. Um, but in the UK, they can be displayed and they can contribute to discussions about Maoism and its legacies. And then finally, to my larger argument, these collections are both demonstrative of British engagements of Mao's China, and I think constitutive of engagements in themselves. As these collections continue to grow, so too will uh, the story of Britain's relationship with Mao era China. So I will finish there uh, for today, and thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Emily. I absolutely love the, the talk and I'm looking forward to diving more deeply in the book. Um, so the way that we'll do this here as we've done in previous uh, China seminar series uh, is, is especially with the online um, medium is that maybe I'll ask people to put their questions in the chat uh, and we'll just kind of go one by one that way. That way we can kind of uh, get a sense of the question and uh, then pose them to Emily. 